My name is Matthew Todd and welcome to Inside the Scale Up. This is the podcast for founders and executives in tech looking to make an impact and learn from their peers within the tech business. We lift the lid on tech businesses, interviewing leaders and following their journey from startup to scale up and beyond, covering everything from developing product market fit, funding and fundraising models to value proposition structure and growth marketing. We learn from their journey so that you can understand how they really work, the failures, the success, the lessons along the way, so that you can take their learnings and apply them within your own startup or scale up and join the ever growing list of high growth UK SaaS businesses. And welcome back to the podcast. Really pleased to be joined today by Mayad, founder of Sigma OS. And yeah, great to have you here. Looking forward to our, our conversation. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. No, no worries. I think, yeah, it'll be a really good good conversation today. I hope there's a lot that, that people can take away from it. As always, I like to kind of kick things off um, with the, the, the guest introducing themselves, introducing their business. So I don't know if you want to uh, just give a little bit of background about yourself. So um, a bit of background about myself. I've been a software engineer for about, I think, 10 years now. Been through the startup journey quite a few times. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm at four or five startups now. <laughs> uh, most of them I was first hire. Uh, and at a certain point, I decided to just, um, you know, start my own thing. Came to the UK about six years ago for studies. Just me, myself, and a backpack nothing much more than that didn't yeah. know anyone here and uh went to king's for computer science and during that time i was always trying to find something new start something new first year of uni i tried to do two startups uh one was basically students sharing food like basically when a student cooks and they cook a bit too much food they can put it on this platform and their like uh hallmates can buy it off of them for a quid or something okay and the second one was basically a augmented reality app that would allow you to measure yourself in the mirror and then try on clothes in augmented reality, kind of like a virtual uh, closet yeah. where you can easily try any clothes on to see if they fit you or not. And then that didn't get much traction. I was first year of uni. I didn't have much experience there. Uh, so I decided to join, start joining a few startups my second year of uh, study. Uh, first startup I joined was, interesting enough, Veed, uh, for like about three, four days. It didn't go well. Um, and then I joined another startup, Memento, for the summer. Uh, I was there for a couple months. Didn't really like it. And then I joined Loop, which was this event organizing app um that wanted to essentially one place to organize your uh events and personal life and parties yeah i was the first engineering hire there uh i was there for three four years I actually met ali and sore of my current co-founders there they were the co-founders of that startup and then uh we tried to fundraise it wasn't working so i left joined another company called compose uh, worked with them for a while, and then uh, pandemic hit. Uh, we had to make some cuts, and then basically I decided I, the, it wasn't getting as interesting anymore for me there. So I decided to move. When things start stagnating, I tend to just be like, "Okay, I'm moving on." Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, that's where the journey of Sigma was actually started. Cool, awesome. That sounds like really, really kind of. Varied experience, you know, firmly kind of in the in the startup land and ecosystem. Um, um, I think, yeah, it'd be good to talk a little bit more about kind of how you got to to Sigma OS and how you got it to where it is now. But yeah, first off, do you want to give people just a bit of a background about what Sigma OS is? So what Sigma OS is, it is a browser that works the way you do. What we mean by that is it's a browser that matches the intentions you have on the web. Uh, The way it works is, for example, in current browsers, if you wanted to, let's say you have a page open, you don't want to attend to it right now, and you want to attend to it at a later time, you would do three of the uh, workarounds instead of keeping it open. You either keep it open and say, okay, I'll come back to it, or you bookmark it, it gets dumped into the bottom of a big ass, yeah. um, you know, folder and you hope to find it at some point. Or third is sending it to yourself on a messaging service, which is the most broken one, in my opinion. Uh, but on Sigma OS, what you can do is actually snooze it. 
So what it means is it goes away and Sigmos brings it back to you automatically. So your actual intention here was like, I don't want to have this here right now. I want to add a later time. And that's what we provide uh, with Sigma OS. And another one is, which uh, is the most important functionality or feature of Sigma OS is workspaces. So what that is, is essentially um, we allow you to create flows. So it's not just about grouping tabs or pages together. Like for each work that you do, you have a specific flow. Uh, for example, let's say you're doing payments. Um, you have your payment app open, your Slack open, your Zero open because you need to send uh, invoice uh, to Zero, invoice to Slack. So usually what a lot of uh, apps do, they say, okay, these are your finance categories. These are your uh, calendar categories. And they put it separately like that, yeah. where we think like, what is your actual flow? What is the way you work? How do you move from app to app? And we categorize it like that into workspaces. And for example, it becomes your finance workspace. It becomes your analytics workspace. And the tabs there are more that you can smoothly go from one task to another without breaking the flow. A great example is what I have is my day starter. Basically, it has tabs that I need first thing in the morning to go through to set up everything for my day. For example, it's calendar, then it's analytics, then it's Slack, then it's um, payment stuff, and then it's our community Slack channel. I see. So it just makes sense for me to have, like, I'm slowly going through the day. And that's basically what we are, a browser that works the way you do your flows, your personal uh, way of working on the web. Yeah, and that sounds really interesting. And I think, you know, many people might ask, do we need another browser? But this, you know, certainly sounds like it's definitely not providing the same kind of user experience at all. And it reminds me of, you know, what happened with email, you know, pretty recently, um, you know, email clients were just pretty static, you know, working the same way as every other yeah. email client with just different skins on them, basically. Um, but then, yeah. you know, I kind of found a few more modern ones that let you do things like, you know, snooze emails for them to come back later, because like, you know, with your browser example, it's not that you don't want it. It's just that you know when you want to get to when it is not right now. So rather than just keeping it in the inbox and doing workarounds like you you suggested with the web, again, you, you snooze it and bring it back. So I think it is a different paradigm, different way of, of working. So no, it sounds really interesting to take that to the browser as well. Yeah. It's basically that like a lot of new apps are coming up in the productivity space or in the experience space, like user experience space. Uh, and the entire thing is called Future of Work or the Work OS uh, movement uh, that focuses on a better experience and experience that makes more sense in terms of the user. Like, did we need another notes app? Did we need another calendar app? Did we need another uh, presentation app? But all these apps, Notion, Airtable, Pitch, Superhuman, all of them came and they are now humongous. And because users are loving them, enjoying them, and it works more reasonably with the workflows we have these days. Yes, that definitely sounds like a more kind of modern and appropriate you know, experience of what people are are trying to achieve. Um, so yeah. I, I guess my kind of first question then leading on from that is, what made you decide that was a problem and, and that that was a problem you wanted to go after? So it was pretty interesting because uh, after leaving Compose, I was looking at different things I could do. Uh, I looked at like going, working at Facebook, Apple, Google, you know, the classic Fang yep. uh, companies. And none of them excited me enough. Like I interviewed for some of them and none of them really made me go like, ooh, I really, really want to, you know, um, join this team or join this company. Yeah. And during that time, actually, I was like, okay, let me apply to a bunch of like accelerator programs. Let's see what happens. And there were two actually uh, that I applied to in London. One was called EF, which is Entrepreneur First, and one is Antler. And interesting enough, my co my current co-founder also applied to both of them. He got into uh, Entrepreneurs First. I got into Antler. Okay. And we were joking about like, oh, we got both networks now. And at some point, we're going to combine the networks. 
And he was doing his own thing at that time uh, on health tech. And at the same time, so the East program, what they do is you join them without an idea. Okay. And basically you spend the entire program finding a co-founder and finding an idea. So that's the entire thing. Yeah. Um, I went through like a few people, just talked to them. I like, like one of them, we started working together uh, and we we're looking at different ideas and, for me, being a techie, I was super excited about technical stuff. And at that time, I was very much in productivity, you know, superhuman, Compose. Basically, when we started building Compose, uh, it used to be a messaging kind of messaging for uh, superhuman for messaging, okay. essentially. Um, and I really enjoyed working on product like that. And I realized I want to work on productivity tools. And I was looking at different things, uh, having like 10 different windows open, uh, 50 tabs on each of them, researching markets, researching ideas. Yeah. I was looking at like how to have Stripe for machine learning, for example, deploy any ML system in production without uh, having any co much code written, basically. Yeah. You focus on the app, we focus on the machine learning or basically visual search stuff. Very high tech thinking like, oh, it would be so cool if we built like a high tech thing. But I was slowly getting tired and like overwhelmed with the constant context switching between them. Mm, okay. I was like, how cool would it be if <laughs> I could actually, you know, do all my work from one window and I didn't have to switch and I didn't have to feel like everything is scattered everywhere. And then I was like, what if I worked on a browser? But browser, like telling yourself I'm going to work on a browser is as scary as saying I'm going to work on a search engine, right? It's such a big thing that you're like, oh, I'm, 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 I'm crazy for thinking that. Yeah. I was like, okay, let's put it in the idea funnel. Let's check it out, competitors. Let's check out uh, users. Let's see if anyone actually has a problem with their browser. So what we did was interesting enough. I started like talking to the batchmates. A lot of them had certain relevant issues to what we were solving. And I actually started talking to Ali, my co-founder, and he was like um, very much like showing me signs that he has these problems as well. And towards the end of the user interview that I did, he was like, what are you building? And I said, well, I'm thinking of building a browser. And he was super excited. He was like, you know what? Like if it, if you actually start building it, I'll be your first check in. I'll put like, even if I can, like 2K, 5K, I'll put it in. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this thing's interesting. Let's do a test. And then I went on namecheap.com and bought ihatemybrowser.com. Nice. And basically started like doing some small Twitter ads and polls with the link to see, okay, how many clicks do we get? How many people are interested? Because yeah. at that point when I told Antler, they were like, Nobody has a problem with their browser. That's mm. a non-problem. You're see. making it, you, you won't get any traction. You are not going to get any sign up, nothing. Within two days, I got 800 people on the wait list of like just one, two tweets of I hate my browser.com. Yeah. Like if you hate your browser, just sign up here. And they were taken aback a bit. They got a bit excited. We did their pre-IC thing. It was going well. And at that time, the person I was thinking of co-founding dropped out. Okay. said like, oh, I got a job at this uh, Series A, Series B company. I'm thinking of doing that. I was like, you know what? Fair enough. No hard feeling. Uh, and then the interesting part was when we uh, parted ways, uh, Anto was like, oh, we, don't, we can't do a single founder thing. I was like, fair enough. I stopped the program there. But I was in contact with this uh, very interesting person uh, called Simon Vance Colina. He's a bit of a known person in London startup world of like basically introducing youngster, like getting very excited about young entrepreneurs. Yeah. So him himself was a founding team member of Monzo. And he would get super excited about cool ideas and then making sure those people can get the right access to VCs and investors and angels and everything. So uh, when I talked to him, I basically uh, DM'd him on Twitter and he was like, yeah, sure, let's jump on a call, talk about it. And I was like, that's cool. 
And when I talked to him, he was pretty excited and then introduced me to a bunch of VCs, a bunch of VC communities. And I started seeing like I'm taking a lot of serious VC calls, like from very, very big VCs to small angels. Yeah. And at that point, uh, Ali was becoming a bit burnt out with what he was working because his co-founder also was slowly dropping out. And what I told him was like, how about this? Uh, what if you work with me one day a week on product with me on Sigma OS? I need a bit of help. I'm starting to think to build a prototype. Then we go from there. Yeah. And he was like, sure, can do it. Loads of friction. Both of us, very big personality, very much like opinionated about our, our products. Yeah. And we started working on it. And then we got a few serious calls uh, for basically last calls with VCs. And basically that's when we met 7%. Uh, 7% Ventures, uh, pretty uh, decent VC uh, that is known to back some of the cooler, um, which call it um, startups that became unicorn. Okay. Uh, and- higher risk ideas then. Yeah, they, they like their big ideas. In their email, the interesting thing was like, uh, when we were, they were talking about it, it was like, we, we like to back you because we think this could be a unicorn and a decacorn. That's why we we're going for it. It's not to be uh, like just, you know, for for a couple millions. So they, yeah. they, they are people who invest early and just ride the entire journey with you. And they were super hopeful from day one. And we started talking to them and interesting enough, they were like, okay, we would like to see a demo. At that point, I had like barely a Figma prototype, like a bit more like kind of everything hard coded. And we were like, okay, cool, let's do it. Uh, I told Ali, look, help me. I know you're working on your own thing, but help me figure this out. We called up our other co-founder, Sorov. Yeah. Just a one man army. He's our CTO now, one man army, just a monster when it comes to tech. And at that time, he was contracting. I was like, I love my contracting job. There's no way I'm going to start a new company. There's no way. I was like, you yeah. know what? Join me, uh, help me do this over the weekend. And when I raise, I'll hire you as a contractor. How about this? And we, the three of us, sat at a WeWork. Uh, for the entire week and then over the weekend at Ali's flat trying to figure out this prototype. And by the end of it, when we walked away, all three of us had this kind of excitement in us that we're like, what if we actually went through with this? What could be the journey be? Like what we could, we could build such a impactful and big thing uh, with Sigma OS. And what if we did it as three co-founders instead of like just, Three, like me building it and them being like kind of contracting. With yeah, me. yeah. And then interesting enough, 7% liked it. They were like, okay, last thing, do you have any potential hires in mind that you want to bring on that we can meet? And I was like, how about this? Ali, you pretend to be the product person. Sort of, you pretend to be the tech person, meet them. And then we go from there. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, cool. Did that. And interesting enough, uh, at that point in my head for a long time, like initially I bring them on like this to give them a taster so I can ask them to be my co-founder. I already had in my mind, I want them to be my I co-founder. See. Yeah, yeah. And 7% Ventures was interesting enough, emailed us, emailed me saying like, okay, we're happy to advance. We want to invest. Uh, whether or not you take our advice on this, uh, we'll still invest. But... Um, how about you make the other two co-founders? I know you started earlier than them, but in the long journey, this doesn't matter. Yep. We didn't care. I didn't personally care because it was like three, four months of work. Nothing like huge saying like, oh, we we basically built, I built the entire company and you guys are just joining it. It, it was like very immature at that point, the product and everything. And I went to, and Ali was emailed me or messaged me, sorry, said, oh, can we uh, talk? And I was like, yeah, met up with him. He was pacing in his living room being like, um, I need to tell you something. It's like, what? It was like, I want to be a co-founder. I was like, I know. That's why I've been teasing you with it. Yeah. Let's be a co-founder. And then 
seven percent e money hit the account, and I call a uh, server up. It's like we got money. So do you want to co-found? And he's just like lying in bed. He was like, you know what? Fuck it, let's do it. And that's where we started. And to be fair, seven percent was our first check for a seed round that we wanted to do at that time. And what they suggested was like, look, you have a bit of money. Why don't you do this? Apply for YC. Y Combinator is an accelerator in the U.S. in California, and some of their biggest companies that came out of there is Airbnb, Dropbox, uh, Coinbase, like all the good ones, all yeah, the a lot of big uh, Senti coins, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, interesting enough, most of the Senti coins I feel like come out of there, um, and it was really cool because we applied, we didn't hear anything for a month. And then and as movers were moving my uh, stuff from my flat to my new flat, I received this email from YC, updates on your application. And in my head, it's like, okay, it doesn't say, oh, we love to talk to you in the title. So it's probably like you're rejected. Yeah. So I skimmed the email trying to find the word, unfortunately. And I don't see the unfortunate. They're like, oh, we actually like to interview you. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. What's the next slot? And I see the next slot is like either the coming Tuesday or two weeks. I was like, okay, I'm not going to wait two weeks. I'm going to be too stressed out of my mind. I literally booked for like in the two next days, the interview, call Ali up, call Sorov up. And for two days, we're walking around London, just asking us the classic YC interview question. What are you building? Yep. And riffing, trying to figure out. And then the interview day comes and we jump on the call. It's literally like 10, 15 minutes of like high speed questions, like from everywhere on the screen. Like it's, it's, well, technically if you were in person, it would be all around the room, but it's not everywhere on the screen because in the zoom, but like you get so many questions and you're trying to answer every one as non bullshit as possible and as accurately as possible, as as best as possible. And the interview ends and we feel all right about ourselves. We don't feel great. Like we hundred percent got it. We didn't feel like absolutely shit. Like we, there's no chance. We were like, we did our best. Okay. Back to work. Were they and difficult then, questions? You know, were they kind of driving into projections or, you know, kind of detailed numbers? You know, what, what were the kind of the they, nature they were, of the questions? The questions, it was very interesting. They weren't asking us, okay, how much money are you making or things like this. They were very much like they, they, it's interesting. And this is something every founder finds out when they do a YC interview. The questions are so relevant and so much more deep than classic, uh, you know, interview or angel or VC questions that it's like, like kind of surface level, they ask you details like, oh, what about this exact thing about your competitor? How are you different in this form? And we were being interviewed by uh, Harsh, Gustav, Nikolaj, and uh, I think one other person. And the interesting thing was uh, we had to interview again. Uh, so basically what happened, what, what happens is after the interview, you either get a phone call if you're accepted or yeah. you get an email if you're rejected. So we stay up until 4 a.m. hoping to get a phone call. And then I say, you know what, guys? You know what? They know it's 4 a.m. in London. That's why I know they're not calling us. Let's go to bed. They're going to call us right in the morning tomorrow, like middle of the day. Completely in denial, by the way. Uh, Because what they do is actually they, like, check if you're up or not. And if it's too late, they ask you, like, hey, call us back. Okay. That's a funny part that I didn't know. Uh, And then... Basically, we received an email at the end of the day and we received an email and we're like, fuck, we got rejected. But what happened was they emailed us to say, actually, we really like the team. Uh, we were a bit unsure about certain parts of your idea. Uh, would you like to do another interview? And we're like, yeah, of course. And Ali and Sorb are like debating, like, should we get the one in two weeks or three weeks? And then I look at them and like, guys, I booked the one for the Friday, this Friday. And they're like, for the love of God, why? Yeah. So we had another two day, three day just to figure out like everything about our product, everything about like the questions they had, because they were nice enough to ask, send us the questions they would want to talk. Okay, I see. And we jumped, and we jumped on uh, the call. It's Gustav and it's only Gustav this time. And he starts off the call with, 
Well, I was growth at Airbnb. I built, basically he built growth at Airbnb. If anyone knows him, he's like the goat of growth at uh, Y Combinator. And he was like, I was the YC partner for Station. So Station was one of our competitors. They died uh, while we were at the batch. Like they were the first like newcomer in the whole, we want to change the browser experience. They did super well on Product Hunt like 9,000 upvotes, product of the day, product of the week, product of the month, product of the year, like all all the things. And they were like, they were unable, I was their partner and they were unable to figure out, um, you know, product market fit. How are you going to figure it out? Yeah. And we start presenting, showing, we showcase the product, how different we are, everything we're throwing at like at him and he asked questions again like we were through 100 200 questions at this point i feel and then he's like okay one final question and we're like okay what is it like what else can we say to convince him and he's like would you like to do yc and i was like hell yeah okay yeah. let's do it and we were so excited we were screaming like there's i think a video on twitter how we we're screaming like monkeys uh out, out of excitement so if anyone wants, just check our Twitter and you're going to laugh. Um, that, that's, that was the start of the YC journey for us. We had a little bit of a hiccup since I'm Iranian. Uh, we got kicked out of YC after two weeks uh, uh, because of U.S. export laws. Uh, we had to jump on a call and talk to them being like, okay, maybe just kick me out. Let me figure out a permanent residency and keep the other two uh, co-founders in. And I managed to figure out a uh, program basically in Paraguay and become basically Paraguayan uh, to basically continue YC. So we basically the story is we got kicked out of YC after two weeks and we hustled our way back into YC in a week or two. And they, they really liked that. Um, they were like, you're generally hustlers. You didn't take no for an answer and you pushed back and you made it through yeah and i was super excited we were back we finished the batch with a very nice high we launched on product hunt and on product hunt uh we became product of the day product of the week product of the month um product hunt wrote a little article about us calling us uh the next number one browser um and it became very exciting. We did a pretty decent uh, fundraising after that. And yeah, we continued building, 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 building after that. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's been the journey from day one until today, where basically we went from kind of couple users that we had that we would interview, talk to manually on board to all the way to having a big funnel of users just coming in every day, like hundreds of users coming in and yeah, like being hundred X where we were a year ago. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. Fantastic progress and, and rate of adoption. How, how important were the product was product hunting in getting that adoption and growth? Uh, product was really valuable for us because right after product hunt, we were getting a user every two minutes. Okay. Wow. And it was becoming very insane for us because uh, everyone there are early adopters. People are hungry for new products. Yeah. And it's very concentrated in the type of people you would want, you would love to have on your product. Um, And it was very valuable. It's not a consistent way of growth because there's a lot of work to be done to ramp up to a launch. But it's a nice, easy way to get, like, consistent, like, every time you go on it, you will at least get a 1,000 people into your product. Yeah. So what are the main kind of sources of of new users on, on on the browser now? For us, it's interesting because it started with Product Hunt and Twitter. But now, these days, people are coming in. And when we talk to them, they're like, oh, I saw someone using it at a cafe or oh, I saw like my friend using it or my colleague using it or people being like, yeah, I've been basically hounding my friends, co-founders or uh, teammates to use it. So it's become, it went from like us, like 
pushing it onto people to them just grabbing it out of our hands, which is a very interesting feeling because people are so passionate now about it that they get mad at us when there's something, something isn't there. Okay. They're like, I love this. Why don't you have this? And we're like, I don't understand if you hate us or love us at this point. Yeah. Because they, they become very much like passionate and like sometimes furious if something isn't working. But there is a difference between like, I'm just furious because your product is shit versus like, I want to use this more. Why don't you have this? Yeah. And that, that, that nuance in the feeling is very different and satisfying for us. Yeah, I guess it shows that that unique perspective that you have on the way that browsers should work really does resonate with them and they are fully bought into that yeah. that unique perspective. Exactly. So it's it's been a very rewarding journey like in terms of going from basically me, my laptop in my studio apartment to basically doing a massive fundraising, having a decent office, a great team around us. And interestingly enough, uh, our team is still relatively small. We're four people with a lot of caffeine compared to our competitors who have like teams of 50 developing yeah. the product. We're just four people with a lot of caffeine and building the same thing and competing with them, which is very rewarding and nice. And it gives me a little bit of a giggle that we are doing basically the same thing, if not better, with yeah. less resources. Um, and yeah, this 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 is has this has been one of the most rewarding journeys uh, for I think all three of us so far. I'm excited for more and more and more. Yeah, no, no, it sounds exciting, definitely. And what then? You know, aside from the the number of employees, what sets you know Sigma OS then aside from your competitors that you've got? I think it's mainly the way we think about the product. Like um, we we really focus on our users, we really focus on our product and what we're building versus how we're perceived. Uh, we don't like uh, mission statements, manifesto or anything like that. Like a bunch of our competitors are talking about like, we are make, we're humanizing the web. We are making the web friendly again, or like we're making the world a better place. Yeah. Meantime, we're like, we're building a browser. We want you to enjoy it. We want to build the best browser that works the way you do. And you can enjoy your time on it and move on. Like, that's yeah. it. We all need to make it so fancy and hoity-toity to, you know, get value or provide value to people. A yeah, more personal message and, rather than claims of changing the whole world. Yeah, like, basically... We, we care more about our users coming to us and being like, this makes me feel genuinely focused than us promoting the idea of we are changing everything fundamentally. The classic, like very much Silicon Valley, if you've seen the, Silicon, the show Silicon Valley, the first season when they're pitching at TechCrunch, this rock, every company, it's like making a joke of every company being like, and we're changing the world for a better place. Yeah. Like all of them, just like this kind of very verbose thing of like, okay, look at us, applaud us. And in the meantime, we're like just heads down, work on the product, talk to the user and actually build a valuable product, a valuable business where you can provide value to people's day-to-day -day jobs. And that's it. And there's nothing, actions speak louder than words. That's, that's a classic thing, right? Yeah. If we can make, people genuinely more successful and they talk on our behalf of like actually your product is amazing there's no reason for me to keep going on you know uh the internet and trying to scream out how amazing sigma was is it speaks for itself yeah no, it sounds like a a very well kind of dialed in you know product-led approach which i think is is fantastic and more people should adopt um, and I guess on that note, one thing I'd be interested in, in kind of hearing your thoughts on our, that kind of initial onboarding experience then, kind of how important have you found that to you know, retaining users once they're, they're inclined to check it out? So the, this is the most important part, like when the activation process for a user is uh, very, very key. Uh, for getting new users. What that means is basically, um, sorry, 
I just got a message. Sorry. No worries. Uh, basically, the onboarding process is very important because the way we have structured our onboarding and activation process is like a game. We're thinking, okay, what is in the first couple minutes, what is the survival kit we can give you that you can survive and thrive in Sigma OS? And because our UI and UX is so much different than standard browser. Like, for example, if we basically built Chrome, but with a underlying cool functionality that you didn't have to even see, yeah. we wouldn't need any onboarding. You've used it a million times. You know how it works. Then yeah. the focus isn't on product. The focus is on distribution. Just, just put out ads, get cheap ads, and go from there, right? Classic example of these days for a browser that break, had a breakthrough is Brave. They're yeah. identical to Chrome. Their only added value is ad block, and basically you earn money as you're browsing. For Sigma OS, it's just basically we are trying to break a lot of built-in habits, whether it's our keyboard shortcuts, workspaces, you know, how you search, how yeah. you uh, interact with pages, tabs, everything, right? So we need an onboarding, and the idea there is we need to showcase every one of them in a very valuable way where the user can feel like, okay, this is actually really cool and exciting, and I get it. Basically, you want them to finish the onboarding with the phrase saying, I get it. Like, why I should use this? Right. Right? Everyone at some point had this experience, for example, with Notion. I get it. It makes sense. That's why I'm going to use it. And we want to give the same thing for Sigma OS. Like at the end of it, they go like, I get it. It makes sense. Yep. And we basically, after the initial onboarding, there is the contents that we send, the contents that we post. But the biggest interesting thing is actually our community. People join our community, can talk directly to us, uh, post questions, problems they might have, feature requests they might have. And what started happening uh, after a while, like basically it's been, it's been quite a while that this has been happening now. Uh, users answer each other. They talk to each okay. other. It's just like a little community now and village that people just solve each other's problems. It reminded me, I was talking to Ali the other day about this. It reminds me of early days of iPhone. Like when the first iPhone came out, it didn't have a user manual. Even though it was such a different phone, you had one button and the rest was screen yep. versus all the other phones, Blackberries and Nokias that had like a million buttons and massive handbooks that explain to you what each thing means. And the way people would find out about stuff about iPhone is like they would discover it and tell their friends like, oh, have you checked this out? Like how this works. Yeah. And this is how Apple always works. They don't have tutorials much at all, if any tutorials or like little onboardings. What they have is essentially um, you are starting to use it. You find things, you learn from the intern, you learn from friends and that's it. And that's the most important part for us as well, where basically users talk to each other and, you know, get the value themselves. Yeah, I think that user-driven kind of content, user-generated content is really, really important. I think once you get over that critical mass, like I say, they support each other, which is, you know, really, really good. But I think, you know, if you look at what Apple have done, you know, there are like articles coming out every week. You know, it seems like, oh, did you know about this hidden feature or whatever it may be? And, it's, you know, it's not a hidden yeah. feature at all, right? It's just someone's hack or preferred way of working with it you know to try and achieve you know something on the iphone and then that generates a whole lot of content a whole lot of interest in in the product and the platform as well doesn't it yeah exactly like it's basically and it's really interesting that you mentioned it this way because uh the whole day starter idea i think one of our users did it as well or uh the way we started seeing how users are using workspaces or the split screen or the snooze functionality or all of the other functionalities made us realize actually there are ways to use even our tool that we didn't think about that are super nice and people are enjoying. And that's the classic thing. Like they found hacks with our product that we didn't think about. And it's very delightful when you see users being disinvested in your product to the point where they, they think, almost day and night about it yeah more than sometimes maybe even if you do like they they 
genuinely it's not about like you pushing the product onto them and be like yeah please use it please use it this is how you use it please use it it's more like here's a tool and they pick it up and try to play with it like a game and they genuinely enjoy it yeah no i think that's amazing and i think that yeah you with those kind of users it enables you to learn at scale but then like you say you're not pushing anything on them you're purely led by their problems and, and what they're trying to achieve which for the you know spe- exactly. I think for any product but for, especially for this kind of products you know it's going to work really really well yeah they, exactly like for us the biggest uh testament to uh what we're doing is valuable is the fact that we have very passionate people talking about it and using it and requesting more and more of it yeah no, I think that's a, a amazing to see and you know to to get the the products to that stage. So I guess my question now then is what's what's next for Sigma OS? How do you you know take what is you know a pretty amazing achievement and and growth and and achieve those kind of bigger ambitions of that unicorn status or beyond? So for us, we are still like building, wrapping up to, uh, we have early signs of product market fit and we are just doubling down on this. Uh, our focus right now is growing, 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 growing to the point where basically um, most people know about us in the space and use us. Uh, our main focus is basically right now we're always iterating over our onboarding because that's one of the most valuable parts of the product. Yeah. One thing we are tr- uh, starting to test is actually uh, collaboration. Uh, feature of work is collaborative. We highly believe in that. And we're starting to work on actually functionalities, which means you can directly collaborate on any website, web page uh, with your teammates, your friends, uh, your you know classmates. Yeah. And that's on the product side. On the team side, we are slowly but surely growing the team and focusing on growth getting as many users as possible cool no amazing sounds like a sounds like a great plan and i certainly look forward to seeing you know seeing how sigma os grows you know i'm sure rapidly over the over the coming months yeah that's that's exciting for us as well yeah to yeah see definitely. where we're going to be we never thought we would be here a year ago when we started on the journey we didn't think we we're going to go through yc we didn't think we would have a good funding. We wouldn't. We didn't think we would be able to do product on. I remember talking to Ali initially. Would be like, "Oh, can you imagine having like top three product of the day?" And not only did we get product of the day, we got product of the week, month, and we're like, "Holy shit! That that's actually amazing! Like that we managed this." Yeah, no, it's a fantastic achievement, and I think for anyone listening to to this podcast. We'll, you know, given that you you kind of weren't expecting that that kind of level of growth and success, what advice would you you give to someone else, kind of you know earlier on in the process, trying to to work out you know how they should launch or how they should get that product market fit? I would tell them iterate, launch as fast as possible. Like launching is so stressful, uh, and you think of it as this big moment where you're announcing it to the world that you're here but sorry to burst your bubble nobody gives a crap (laughs) when you actually launch the first few times first 10 times no the noise out there is so much that nobody knows you nobody cares about you and they will forget about you so it's better that you launch fuck up learn from it iterate improve than keeping it in spending more time and then launching because it's very, very like, unless you are a wizard, the first few times you launch, people, you're going to have problems. People are going to look at it and be like, um, no, this is not for me. Product yeah. Hunt was not our first launch. It was our first launch on Product Hunt, but we had launched at least 10, 20 times on book phase, different platforms to our friends and families, people not caring whatsoever. Yeah. Like we would be very greatly disappointed. We literally launched on hacking news and people tore us to pieces there. Really? And 
Yeah, they were like, why would anyone need this? The funny part was they were using the classic phrases from the Dropbox launch where it's just like, oh, I could do this in Linux with this and this and this. Oh, okay. We're like, that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> Last time you guys said that, Dropbox came out. So I guess we're doing something right at least. But that's the interesting part. Like, don't be scared of launching. Don't be scared of putting yourself out there. Just go ahead, do it, learn from it and do better next time. That's it. That's all you can do. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. Like a, a launch is not just one thing that you're pinning everything on, right? It's almost like a series yeah. of launch experiments. Be willing to learn exactly. from this. Exactly. You you are constantly launching. Like if you look at any, that's a differentiator between a uh, horrible startup, a decent startup, and a great startup, what is the rate that you're launching at? Did you yeah. launch once a month? Did you put out a new release, a new update? Did you do something every month? Yes or no? Like, if you haven't, for us, we basically have two releases every week. And that's how we learn. We basically do a test run, and then we do a pop- proper release one every week every single week. So we have basically four launches a month. Yeah. Right. And then every other month we have a bigger launch on product hunt or on different platforms like indie hackers or whatever. And that's the biggest thing for us that makes us learn, okay, are we better than two months ago or worse? Or how are we doing in the entirety of the journey? But we kept it inside and waited for the perfect moment to have it's like launching being the silver bullet to all our all your problems that's not the case it's not a silver bullet it's just another you know bullet that yeah. you have in your chamber and you need to use it all the time yeah and 100 percent agree and i like what you said there about that question to ask yourself of are we better than two months ago and if you're not putting yourself out there if you're you know just keeping everything internal you you never get an answer to that question the answer is exactly is always No, because you haven't done anything. Exactly. Like, worse than no is like, yeah, we are, because we've been building, like, just because you've written lines of code, didn't design, done work, doesn't mean you're better. That's that's the hard reality of startups. Just because you're putting energy in doesn't mean you get value out. Like, you can be working 20 hours a day, every day, for three months, four months, but never spoken to a single user. This is less valuable of you speaking 15 minutes to an actual user. Hands down, guaranteed. There's there's never been a successful startup that got this way, that they didn't talk to their customer. If there is an end user, end customer, whether it's B2B, enterprise, whatever, like, if you've never spoken to them and spend months building that thing is not valuable at all it's less than like valuable than a toy yeah i I think that value is only ever something that is extracted by the end user it's not something that you can put in that's why i think what you described is is very kind of product and problem led versus solution led i think too many startups are so led by the features by the solution and they try and sell a market based on that rather than having that truer you know deeper connection with their end users because problem led is sometimes not as exciting because like especially for technology based startups and founders it's so exciting to use like new technologies, new programming languages, new design paradigms. Like it's super exciting. I'm I'm building things. But sometimes the problem is so big, but the solution to it is so simplistic and so unsexy that you're like, oh, okay. But if you're not passionate about the problem, then you shouldn't be working on it. There is enough problems that might, you know, uh, pique your interest that you can go for that might the solution might be interesting for you as well yeah for us uh, we are genuinely curious people but we like the problem of the browser and the solution was building a browser a very difficult very frustrating thing to build at points because for example uh, interesting enough Riverside.fm uh, doesn't work on Safari 
So our engine is Safari based, so it doesn't work on Sigma OS. So I opened it, sometimes happens, we open pages and we freak out and we're like, oh, is Sigma OS broken? And then we check it on Safari and we say, oh, it doesn't work on Safari. I open yeah. it on Chrome and I'm like, okay, it works. And then we have to go backwards and make sure like, okay, for this website, use this agent, do it this way. And it works for Sigma OS as well. So there's okay. like this kind of a plethora of like different pages that exist on the web that might not work for a brow- our browser that works on Chrome or might not work on Chrome works on Safari that you have to make sure you have covered all the bases. But at the same time, this is something we're excited about and we enjoy every day getting in and working on it. Yeah, no, I think that's that's definitely the right approach. And I think that's that's what happens if you're, you're problem and product led. Um, and I think that's a a great message to kind of leave people with, I think, to to wrap up this conversation. I'm, I'm sure we'll have another conversation in the future to catch up and see how things have been developing. But I think it's a, a great way awesome. to to round things off for now is you know, emphasizing that importance of being customer-led, buyer-led, problem-led, and yeah. challenging you know, the status quo of just because this is how browsers work doesn't mean that's what is right for the way that people are actually trying to use them now, right? The the internet has changed um, and, you know, it's changing all the time and the, the way people are using it and the way they interact with it, you know, continually evolves. Um, so, no, you know, thank you for this conversation. It's been massively, massively interesting and I hope people do take notes and, and listen to it and adopt a lot of what we've talked about. Um, but for anyone that's interested in you know what they've heard about sigma os and wants to give it a go for themselves where should they where should they head to i hate my browser.com that's the easiest uh link to go to fantastic i look forward to seeing how many people uh, are, are coming in via that link so um yeah thank you very much again really enjoyed the conversation and i'm sure we'll we'll speak again soon same thanks for having me thank you for joining me on this episode of inside the scaler Remember, for the show notes and in-depth resources from today's guest, you can find these on the website insidethescaleup.com. You can also leave feedback on today's episode, as well as suggest guests and companies you'd like to hear from. Thank you for listening.